When people think of gold, Australia often comes to mind. And for a good reason, the country has definitely earned a golden crown. But the truth is, much of the country has already been heavily prospected and picked over, especially in the eastern states. If I had to choose just one place in the world to prospect and mine for gold today, it would be Alaska. What's happening in Alaska right now is nothing short of extraordinary. And thanks to some hardworking miners sharing their journeys on YouTube, we get a front row seat. The yields they're pulling from the Bering Sea are astonishing. Truly one of the closest glimpses we've had in modern times into what Australia must have been like during the gold rush of the 1850s. If you haven't already, check out some of the channels of miners from Alaska. They are getting incredible gold every day as they go out and dredge the sea. But these days in Australia, unless you're in the middle of the desert in Western Australia or the Northern Territory, battling the heat with a metal detector, you'd be lucky to find even a few grams of gold consistently. And consistency is the key word here. In contrast, many of these Alaskan miners are pulling out ounces of gold every week, with no sign of it slowing down. Naturally, that got me thinking. Is there anywhere in Australia with geology similar to Alaska's gold-rich Bering Sea coast? In this video, we're going to look into why so much gold exists off the coast of Nome in Alaska and investigate whether Australia has any geological equivalents hidden within its borders. Firstly, let's take a look at how such an astonishing amount of gold exists in Alaska. Our story begins hundreds of millions of years ago. Jeez, I say that a lot. Deep beneath what is now Northwest Alaska, during ancient orogenies, episodes of mountain building caused by tectonic plates colliding, hot fluids rich in minerals coursed through the crust of the Seward Peninsula. These hydrothermal fluids invaded cracks in the rock, cooling and crystallizing to deposit quartz veins laced with gold. The bedrock of the Nome region is part of the Nome Complex, a package of metamorphic rocks that was deformed and heated during the early Cretaceous period. Around 110 million years ago, this geologic crucible created orogenic gold deposits, small but high-grade gold-bearing veins scattered through the schists and marbles of the ancestral mountains. In essence, Gnome's gold was born from the heat and pressure of a mountain-building era, long before humans ever dreamed of panning these shores. Over immense spans of time, those gold-bearing veins in the bedrock became the mother loads of Gnome's future placers. As the mountains above slowly eroded under rain and wind, Vein gold was released flake by flake and nugget by nugget. Some gold remained embedded in weathered rock near its source, while much was carried downhill by streams. By the late tertiary period, millions of years ago, the region likely had typical alluvial placers, accumulations of gold in stream gravels at the foot of the hills. But the real transformation came during the most recent chapter of Earth's history, the Pleistocene Ice Age. It was the ice that would scatter and concentrate Gnome's gold in ways no ordinary river could. Fast forward to the Quaternary Ice Age, the past 2 million years. During this time, glaciers repeatedly formed in high latitudes. Sea levels fell drastically as water locked into ice sheets, exposing vast lands like the Bering Land Bridge that once connected Alaska and Siberia. In several glacial pulses, parts of the Seward Peninsula, including hills just inland of Gnome, were enveloped by ice or at least heavily impacted by nearby ice lobes. Thick glaciers bulldozed across gold-bearing ground, acting like giant natural excavators. They scraped up soil, gravel and bedrock, including the gold from those old placers and loads, and dragged this debris along as unsorted glacial drift. During times of lowered sea level, some glaciers even pushed this auriferous or gold-bearing debris beyond today's shoreline out onto what was once then dry land in the Bering Sea Basin. One US Geological Survey notes that ice lobes from Siberia's Chukotka Peninsula reached nearly to the center of what is now the northern Bering Sea, scattering Alaskan and Asian rock debris together on the exposed seafloor. When the climate warmed and the glaciers melted back, they left their cargo of sediments behind. Imagine the scene. As the ice retreated, moraine hills and outwashed plains of sand and gravel were dumped across the coastal plain near Nome. Critically, this glacial till was peppered with countless flecks of gold, not gleaming in veins anymore, but mixed as particulate gold among boulders, sand and silt. In fact, samples show that the otherwise ordinary looking grey till in the Nome area consistently contained small amounts of gold, on the order of 70 parts per billion. That may sound dilute, but across an entire glacial plain, it added up to a substantial gold inventory. 
Essentially, the glaciers had gathered gold from a wide area, eroding many different gold veins and placers in the hills, and concentrated it into one giant pile of debris right at the coast. Nature had delivered a gold-rich mix to the shoreline, setting the stage for the ocean to take over the job of concentration. As the Ice Age ended around 12,000 years ago, global sea level began to rise dramatically. The Bering Land Bridge sank beneath the waves, and the shoreline at Nome crept inland. This rising sea did more than just flood the land, it actively reworked the glacial sediments that were laden with gold. Waves and nearshore currents attacked the unconsolidated drift, washing away lighter materials like sand, mud and gravel, and leaving behind heavier pieces like cobbles and gold. In effect, the ocean surf acted as a colossal natural sluice box, sorting the sediment by weight. Geologists have found that the transgressing sea left a relic gravel lag deposit, a thin veneer of well-winnowed gravel on top of the old glacial deposits, and this gravel is richly auriferous, or gold-rich, along parts of the southern Seward Peninsula coast. In some places, the gravel lag is only a few inches thick, but it contains significantly elevated gold concentrations compared to the original till beneath. Essentially, the pounding waves picked the glacial gold nuggets out of the clay and sand and concentrated them in pockets on the seafloor. During this marine transgression, the coastline didn't just move steadily, it likely paused at times, forming ancient beach lines at different elevations. Geologists in Nome identify old submerged beach ridges at roughly 11 metres, 21 metres and 24 metres below today's sea level. Each stationary shoreline was an opportunity for waves to work over the sediments and build placer concentrations. Thick beach gravels accumulated in some stable shoreline periods, while thin gravel lag formed when the shoreline moved quickly. Some of those old beaches are now under the sea at various depths, forming what miners call submarine beaches. Indeed, gold has been found in samples from these submerged paleo beach gravels, though the richest concentrations often lie a bit deeper than surface sampling can reach. As the shoreline finally settled in its modern position, additional gold was locally introduced by streams and longshore currents. Rivers like the Snake and Nome River continued to wash small amounts of gold out to the coast in post-glacial times, forming deltas and fans, though these later contributions were minor compared to the Pleistocene motherlode. The end result of all of this geological reworking is a district-wide placer system, a broad swath of near-shore seafloor and modern beach placers at Nome containing appreciable gold. Prospectors in 1900 famously scooped these gold-rich beach sands by the panful. The coarse gold flakes, flakes 1mm or larger, tends to be found very near its source. For example, close to where old streams emerged or where the bedrock is exposed on the seafloor. Smaller flower gold has travelled farther, sifting laterally along the coast in storm currents. This means the richest patches offshore often occur near geologic features. For instance, off the mouth of ancient gold-bearing stream channels, or atop shallow bedrock ledges where gold-bearing glacial gravels were trapped. Now that we've covered how gold saturated the coast of Alaska, let's turn to Australia. Does Australia have anything similar to the beach deposits found in Alaska? To which, sadly, the answer is no. Nowhere around Australia's coast do we find a gnome-style gold placer in the surf. The answer lies in Australia's very different geological history and climate. Let's examine the key factors. Australia's gold deposits were largely formed during ancient orogenies, that are far older and often far inland compared to gnomes. For example, Western Australia's gold, Kalgoorlie and others, formed 2.7 billion years ago in the Archean era, and Eastern Australia's gold, like the Victorian gold belt, formed 400 million years ago during the Paleozoic. These gold-rich regions are mostly inland or in old mountain belts that have since worn down. Crucially, Australia has been tectonically stable in recent geologic times, unlike Alaska which lies along active plate boundaries. Australia sits in the middle of the Indo-Australian plate. There haven't been any recent mountain building events to uplift new gold-bearing ranges next to the sea. By the time of the Ice Age, Australia's gold was locked up in landscapes far from the ocean, or in some cases buried under later sediment. So when sea levels fluctuated in a Pleistocene, there were no gold-rich deposits sitting on Australia's continental shelf waiting to be reworked. The gold was mostly on land, often in interior basins or highlands. But one of the starkest differences is glaciation. During the last ice age, as we saw, Alaska was heavily glaciated. 
Australia, by contrast, was almost entirely ice-free during the Pleistocene. The Australian continent never had the massive ice sheets that covered Alaska, Canada, or Northern Europe. The only Pleistocene glaciers in Australia were restricted to a small area of the Snowy Mountains, around Mount Kosciuszko in New South Wales, and parts of Tasmania. These were relatively small alpine glaciers. They did not grind across vast areas or carry material to the sea on the scale seen in Alaska. In fact, Pleistocene glaciation in Australia never extended to most of the coastline, except in western Tasmania. So Australia lacked the glacial conveyor belt that in Nome's case delivered gold-bearing gravels directly to the shore. Without big glaciers to erode and transport gold en masse, Australia's placer gold remained mainly in river valleys and alluvial deposits near where it weathered out. Australian prospectors often found gold in ancient buried river channels, so-called deep leads, or scattered through broad alluvial plains, but not concentrated in surf zones, because no Ice Age bulldozers dumped the gold at the ocean's edge. In summary, Australia lacked the one-two punch of geology and glaciology that gifted Nome its offshore gold. The tectonic settings put Australia's gold in places where later coastal processes couldn't easily gather it. And the Pleistocene climate spared Australia the radical glacial remixing that northwestern North America experienced. The result is that while Australia is rich in gold overall, its gold is found in traditional alluvial deposits and hard rock mines, not strewn along its modern beaches. The contrast between Nome's gilded sea floor and Australia's sedate shores underscores how unique combinations of geological events lead to very different outcomes on the world stage. In Nome, ancient mountain building created the gold. Ice Age glaciers gathered and delivered it, and the sea itself concentrated it into rich placers. A collaboration across eons that produced a gold miner's paradise by the ocean. In Australia, gold followed a more conventional path, formed in bedrock and released by weathering into rivers. It never experienced the same glacial turbocharge or marine concentration, and thus no Bering Sea gold scene emerged down under. Standing on Nome's stormy beach, one can almost read the history in the bluff cliffs and offshore bars. Layers of ancient river gravels, glacial tills and beach sands, all testifying to cycles of uplift, ice and sea. Each layer contributed to the gold that prospectors found lying in the sand in 1899. Meanwhile, on an Australian beach, the sand tells a quieter story of steady erosion and gentle waves, with heavy minerals but only the faintest traces of gold. Gnome's Bering Sea Gold is indeed a geological gift, one that required just the right conditions in just the right place. A phenomenon more localised than global, and a product of circumstances that Australia, for all its gold, simply did not share. I hope you found this as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.